is Heather Larkin. It's really an honor to be here with all of you today. I'm an associate professor in the School of Social Welfare, and I'm very happy to have the chance to introduce David Wallace to you next. You all have your agendas, hopefully, with your packets that you got when you came in this morning. There's a terrific presentation by Susan Dreyfus. Thank you all so much. I'm really happy to introduce David Wallace, who will be presenting Beyond ACE Research, Transforming Policy, Programming, and Practice. David Wallace is the Clinical Director at LaSalle School. With nearly 20 years of child welfare and juvenile justice experience, Mr. Wallace serves as Clinical Director at LaSalle School and Adjunct Faculty at Sage Graduate School. Mr. Wallace is also an active trainer and consultant throughout New York and nationally on topics of sexual aggression and trauma. We're really honored to have him here presenting today. Thank you so much, David, and leave it to you. I'll wander around a little bit and we'll make the cameraman work for his money a little bit in tracking me around the, uh, around the stage. I, um, I'm really uh, thankful and honored to be standing on the, uh, on the stage here on Page Hall. I'm a graduate of the MSW program here. Um, show of hands, MSWs from this program. Current students, anyone show of hands? Fantastic, okay, great. Um, to expand on my introduction a little bit, uh, I mentioned I'm a, I am a social worker, I am a clinician uh, at heart, and most of what I talk about today will be from the perspective of treatment and clinical skills, and I will also attempt to weave together policy and program development. I found myself thrust into a role of administration and program development and management a couple of years ago, but uh, um, I still cling to my, my clinical roots and my social work roots, and I think there's no better conversation um, related to social work core values than the discussion today around adverse childhood experiences, and so I'm, I'm thankful to be a part of, this, part of this process, and thank you for your time this morning. Um, my, uh, my work started in the field about 20 years ago as a direct care worker and foster care worker. I was a case manager for St. Christopher Adderley in their thought, uh, therapeutic foster care program in and around New York City and Long Island. I've also worked in uh, day service programs at the University of Binghamton in their uh, children's units and was direct care staff at Parsons in uh, Watson Cottage. And so I've done my fair share of really challenging, uh, stressful, and traumatic safety holds. Um, I've been in very difficult positions and uh, did do my master's work here at the university and made it all the way down the street to uh, LaSalle where I've been uh, for the last eight or nine years. Prior to that, I was at St. Anne Institute around the, around the block from uh, from LaSalle and worked with uh, Dr. Richard Hamill in Forensic Mental Health Associates for about eight or nine years and so I just can't seem to get out of the neighborhood um, but it is it is great to be a part of the process today. Um, because I'm a clinician and uh, do uh, quite a bit of training and lecturing. I really would prefer dialogue, conversation. This is a pretty big group, and so I don't know how much I'll be able to accommodate of that. But if you do have questions, feel free to shoot up a hand. I'll do what I can to answer questions and respond to comments as we go. Uh, we've got some microphones down front, and uh, just to make sure people can hear one another, I'll try to do that and accommodate that uh, to the extent that, that I can, and, and we don't run uh, too much over. I'm, uh, I'm what stands between you and lunch, so I will do my best to be done. <laughs> at noon and get you to lunch uh, so you can keep your strength and stamina through what uh, is sure to be a, a pretty uh, action-packed and uh, pretty ambitious agenda for today. Okay. Susan Dreyfus um, really set the stage nicely, as difficult and challenging and frightening as it is to follow her as a speaker. Uh, I'll do my best and, uh, and try to keep up with, with her pace. But she talked about motivational interviewing. And uh, in keeping with that, uh, I'd like to ask just a couple of people quickly, what is it that you would like to get at the end of our 90 minutes today? What is gonna make this valuable and feel like this was a good use of your time? You're all spending a day out of the office, away from home, away from children, families, whatever it is your primary responsibilities are, and I wanna honor that time that you've dedicated to this process, and I just wanna see a couple of people, what is it you're hoping to get by noon today, and how could I be helpful in that, in that time? Anyone wanna, wanna share? Don't make me come down there with the microphone. Yes, right here. Something I can use every day. Something you can use every day in the field. Okay, so if we accomplish that, you'll have walked out of here by, by noon with lunch and something, something tangible. Yes. Anything else? Yes. Yes. <laughs> 
Okay, something to improve the capacity that your clients have to be successful. Is that, is that a fair reframe? Okay. Anyone else? Yes. So strategies for transforming organizational culture around uh, trauma and AIDS. Okay, so strategies to help move, shift, transform organizational culture and be more ACE informed as an agency, not just as an individual practitioner. Okay, fantastic. Anyone else? Yes. Okay. So some good examples about how ACES has impacted policy. Um, I'll try to get to that a little bit uh, uh, this morning, but I think we'll really hear more from the, uh, the panel later this afternoon specific to policy, but I will, I will talk a little bit about that. And at least I'll leave you some questions and food for thought as you're, uh, as you're working through your lunches. I'll give you some stuff to be thinking about and bringing back, and, and uh, we'll see what we can accomplish in the first half of the day. Anything else that people are hoping to get in the next 90 minutes? Yes, right in front. So if I, understand, if I understand the question, can ACEs help people transition and have a better sense and view of themselves, successful, successful be more future oriented? Okay, okay, I think, I think we'll get there too. Okay, all right. Yes, right here. How ACEs can inform educational programs. Excellent, excellent question, excellent point. What I do hope to accomplish in the next 90 minutes and throughout the rest of the afternoon as you're hearing panelists and other, other speakers, I would encourage people, as much as, as much as I continue to say I'm a social worker, I'm a clinician, I would be thinking about how this really does apply to you. And I would say absolutely it applies to educators, it applies to law enforcement, it applies to probation, uh, police officers, family court judges, it applies to policy makers, government, uh, all of that. And I really think that this creates a nice platform and a common language for us to all be thinking about the goals that we share between our different disciplines. And I think, I think we'll get back there. Okay. All right. That's, that's, a, that's, a, pretty good, uh, that's a pretty good sense of, of where you're at. Just a quick show of hands. How many people uh, have never heard of ACEs other than this morning and you're really, really here for a, a 101 introduction to ACEs and some of the science and definitions? Okay, I see a few hands. How many people feel like they've got a moderate sense of ACEs and what it might, what it might be all about? Okay, a better number of you. How many feel like they're experts and I can hand you the microphone and you can take over? Okay, would you come up and take over my election? Okay, so let's see, I'm gonna, I am going to try to, um, um, try to do a broad brush introduction here. You, talk, you, you heard Susan this morning talk about ACEs. It seems like the bulk of you are kind of right in the middle. You've got some sense of what ACEs is all about, what they were looking at, and it sounds like you're here to try to figure out, all right, what does it all mean? How does, it, how does this uh, apply to my life, my profession, my goals, my agency, my practice? And I think that's a great place for us to be today. For those of you who are really just figuring this out, ACEs, uh, when we refer to this, we're talking about a study that was uh, begun in 1995, 1997 by Kaiser Permanente partnership with the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC. Uh, people familiar with the CDC? Yeah. They track really bad stuff that can kill lots of people, malaria, bubonic plague, things like that. People saw the movie Contagion. <laughs> yes, okay, it's the kind of thing where you open the doors with your elbows on the way out. Somebody sneezed next to me while I was watching that movie, I was terrified, right? <laughs> That's the stuff that CDC pays attention to. Public health concerns. They're tracking ACEs, and they've been paying attention to ACEs since 1995, 1997. There's a ton of research, a ton of information, lots of material on the CDC website. Feel free to check it out. There's probably about 50 or 60 studies there, ongoing research. We'll talk a little bit about that. What I want you to walk away with today is 1995, 1997, Kaiser Permanente, a large managed healthcare organization. Healthcare, not behavioral health, not mental health, not, it wasn't NIM doing the study, it was CDC doing the study in partnership with, the CD, with uh, Kaiser Permanente. They tracked about 17,000 of their enrollees and asked them the set of questions that I'll show you in a moment. And they started, they started linking long-term chronic health concerns with how people responded to this retrospective analysis of, of uh, the adverse childhood experiences that they, that they encountered prior to the age of 18. And I want you to keep that in, in your mind as we move forward through the, through the conversation this morning. We do know that of their sample, about two thirds of the population reported at least one ACE. None of us get through childhood without some adversity. 
without some traumatic event, without something that's disruptive and dangerous and problematic. That's, that's the unfortunate reality of life. We also know that about a fifth of their population reported three or more ACEs, and that's the population that we'll pay attention to as we move forward. Okay. I know this is difficult to read, but this is the ACE questionnaire. It's very simple, it's very straightforward, it's 10 questions. True, false. Have you ever experienced sexual abuse? Have you ever been physically abused? Have you ever witnessed domestic violence? Have you ever lost a caregiver to divorce, prison, death? Think about the families you're working with. Think about the children you're working with. Think about the adults that you're working with. And again, whether you're juvenile justice, criminal justice, child welfare, policy, research, think about the families and children that our work is attempting to benefit and touch and be a benefit to. Think about the, how they may respond to these questions. Take one child, one family you've been working with that you know well, and just think in your head, how many yeses would they provide? We know that trauma comes in many forms. This is borrowed from Joanne Schladel. She's a, anyone familiar with Joanne Schladel? Yes, some of you. If you're not, get familiar with her. Start reading her material. She's a, first of all, fantastic woman. One of the warmest, kindest, gentlest women, woman that, uh, that, uh, that I've ever met. Whenever I see her, she gives me a big hug. She makes me feel like I just got home. It's really, really nice. I've known Joe for about uh, nine or 10 years. She's been talking about trauma and trauma-informed care for sexually aggressive and violent youth for 15 or 20 years. She's ahead of her time, ahead of the curve, ahead of all of us. We're catching up with Joe Schladel. You can find her work at Res uh, Resources for Resolving Violence. She's out of Freeport, Maine, and is very closely associated with the Massachusetts Association for the Treatment of Sexual Abusers and the New England Adolescent Research Institute. And I encourage you all, all to take a look at, uh, to look at those resources and at the, uh, the books and articles that Joe is responsible for putting out. But she's been talking about trauma and its impact on youth and families and how it's, it's highly related to aggression and delinquency and sexual abuse. And she talks about trauma coming in many forms, that it comes from violence, interpersonal, Right. We think about that very quickly when we talk about trauma. We think about combat, combat stress, PTSD. But we also want to think about interpersonal violence, physical abuse, sexual abuse, gang violence, random acts of violence that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. She also talks about media violence, repeated exposure to graphic violence through the news, television, movies, video games watching the Twin Towers come down again and again and again and again created problems for many of us who were nowhere near New York City that day. She talks about poverty. You heard Susan Dreyfus talk about poverty and the relationship between poverty and neglect and abandonment and trauma. That poverty is being seen as a, as a significant, having a significant relationship to trauma and to some of the brain deficits that we'll talk about throughout the course of this morning and into into the afternoon. The ACES major findings are, are critical, and this really will set the stage for what it is we're talking about throughout the rest of this morning and into the afternoon. Kaiser Permanente and CDC figured out that, uh, again, two-thirds of their study population, 17,000 adults that had insurance, were getting their medical needs met uh, through a clinic that, that they were operating, reported one or more ACE and that about a fifth reported three or more. And what they found about that fifth, the population, that subpopulation of individuals that had more than three ACEs, there was a significant relationship between those yeses and short and long-term medical problems. And you can see the list here. It's pretty lengthy stuff. COPD, chronic cardiovascular disease, early death, alcoholism, substance abuse, suicide, mental illness. Probably not so shocking to hear that trauma might lead to other mental health disorders, but they found a link between early exposure to trauma and medical, chronic medical problems, diabetes, obesity, things of that nature, which not for nothing are pretty costly to the healthcare system 
which will be important when we talk about policy and funding, start thinking about who's got a stake in reducing ACE exposure in children. Who's got a stake in resolving and mitigating the effects of ACEs in adults? Could it be that the health insurance industry, that medical practitioners have something to gain from some positive impact on reducing and mitigating the effects of, of ACEs in children and, and adults? We also know that the impact of ACEs is graded. In other words, the more yeses you accumulate, the greater likelihood you've got of developing one or more of these chronic medical diseases or mental health diseases. And the great, great degree of comorbidity exists between the medical and mental health disorders. We know that comparing individuals with four or more ACEs to individuals with none, which are hard to find, but a significant jump in substance abuse, depression, suicide, other mental health disorders, four to 12 fold increase, a two to four times increase in smoking and poor self-rated health. In other words, ACEs put you at risk of being a smoker and developing all of the other chronic health problems that we take for granted and being associated with, with smoking. We know that individuals with high ACE scores tend to take greater sexual risks and put themselves at risk for great, great disease and other early pregnancy, things like that, and higher risk for premature death, shorter lifespan, underemployment, homelessness, which you'll, you'll hear Dr. Heather Larkin talking about this afternoon. We know that the impact of trauma is severe and significant with children. We know that children who have been exposed to a great deal of trauma and violence in their lives, and again, this is adapted from the work of Joanne Schladel, and uh, you heard Susan talk already about the Center for the Developing Child at Harvard. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with that website, I would encourage you to get there. There are a lot of powerful, short, well done video clips, two, three, four, five minutes in length, very succinct, very well done, and really get at the heart of policy, the science, the emerging evidence coming out about neurobiology, development, the impact of trauma on the developing brain of a child, and ways to increase resili resiliency, strength, coping skills, so on and so forth. So I'd encourage you to get, to get to the Harvard website and check that material out. But we know that children who have been exposed to a great deal of violence and adverse childhood experiences exhibit a great deal of problematic behaviors. For those of you who work in child welfare or juvenile justice, this list should not be shocking to you. Think about the kids and families on your caseloads, and this probably lines up bullet for bullet with most, if not all, of your caseloads. Yes, nod of the heads, shake of the heads. I see a lot of nodding. Okay, good. You had asked me before about how this aligns with agency culture. And, and one of the things that we're doing at LaSalle is this information you're seeing today is part of our standard and core training for every single new employee that comes on property. They get it at orientation and they get it every six months. It is embedded in our ongoing training for staff, whether you're a clinician, whether you're a direct care worker or faculty, that we believe as an agency, you need to understand the youth that we are working with and understand that the behaviors that they are exhibiting probably have something to do with their mental health, probably have something to do with their academic dysfunction, and probably have something to do with their exposure to adverse childhood experiences prior to getting to our facility. And to help staff depersonalize that behavior and understand it for what it is, and to help them understand what they can do by way of intervention, relationship, mentoring, support, consistency, compassion, empathy, and how they start to drive change and encourage change and model skill development in the youth that we're working with. And so we talk to our staff about ACEs, we talk to our staff about mental health, we talk to our staff about trauma, and we start to talk to them about this list right here. And we can do a crosswalk. If we had a child in our care exhibiting impulsive behavior, how might that show up diagnostically? Are we likely to see that individual as having ADHD? Probably, right? Anyone want to take a guess as to what happens to a child with significant trauma acting impulsively related to the trauma misdiagnosed with ADHD and getting a psychostimulant as their treatment? I hear some grumbling. You think that has a positive effect? Negative effect? Negative effect. By misdiagnosing what it is we're seeing, we've inadvertently exacerbated 
the trauma symptoms and the acting out behavior, the acting out potential. And so we talked to our staff about how important and how complicated that differential diagnosis process is and that their role as staff, as faculty, as clinicians, is to be talking to one another. And we in a residential setting have the benefit of having staff working with our children 24-7 hours a day. That's not, that's, not a, uh, um, that's not something that an outpatient provider or a community-based setting can do. And so that, I think that's a benefit of residential care that we have eyes on. We have, we have reports coming in constantly. A child can perform, behave, look a certain way in my office for an hour a week, but direct care staff are going to have a much better sense of how that child is performing, behaving, and generalizing the skills that they are learning in treatment to a real setting. And that feedback is critical for us to inform the differential diagnosis and to communicate with our psychiatry and clinicians. And we're generating a feedback loop between direct care faculty and clinicians and finding ways to communicate and talk. But you've got to start with training and you've got to start with information and you've got to start with a common language. At LaSalle, we happen to be using ACEs as a platform for that common language. There's lots of other things that we talk about, but we start here and build and build on that foundation. We talk to them about apathy and desensitization. Diagnostically, that may look like depression and could be misdiagnosed as depression. Or it could look like the kid just doesn't care and is unmotivated and I wish he would just get up and get moving and start getting that work done. And so if we talk about this, that apathy and that desensitization, I think that helps our staff and our faculty and our young clinicians or case managers understand that this is the best that they can do in this moment and that this is a result of the trauma that they've experienced. And again, it depersonalizes the behavior and it reframes how we're thinking about this resistance that we're seeing in our client populations or the resistance that we're seeing in our parent populations who just can't seem to get motivated and get in the front door and benefit from all the wonderful services that we've got. And we tend to label and think about them in pejorative terms. But what if we start looking at the ACEs they've experienced and that really helps us shift our thinking about, about our parents and what skills and what obstacles they have in their way. We talk about increased fragmentation of memory. The kids with high A scores who have been exposed to a great deal of violence have a hard time sequencing events. Our facility happens to be a TCI facility. We talk about using uh, LSIs or life space interviews to debrief a crisis event with a child. And, and many of our staff, well, they feel like a child just goes, you know, instead of going A to B to C to D, the way we'd like them to go in an LSI, and not for nothing, that's, the, what, that's what clinicians like to do when we debrief or when we use cognitive behavioral interventions. We sort of get that script. We sort of unravel what happened. As a cognitive behaviorally trained therapist, I like to know about the antecedents to behavior. I like to have my client walk me through, well, what happened before that? And how were you feeling when that happened? And, and I, I, I rely on that, on that ability for a client to give me a, a sequence, a timeline. And we know that children who have, exposed, have been exposed to a great deal of violence have a hard time going from A to B to C to D. They may go from A to Z to W to X to F and bounce around. And we can misinterpret that as cognitive impairment. We can misinterpret that as resistance. We can misinterpret that as they're just lying or being manipulative. And so again, when you ask about agency culture, if our direct care staff and our faculty or case managers, folks that are not clinically trained and have, have the benefit of the education that the university is providing, could this help them reframe their thinking about that behavior and take a different approach? Or to know they've got to wait maybe some time for a child to really come back into, into baseline before they debrief. Or to maybe take that debrief with a grain of salt and be thinking that over time, that's the benefit, repeated exposure to that debrief rather than thinking that it's going to stick the first time. Can we talk about anxious anticipation of future events? Kids that have been exposed to a great deal of trauma and violence are kind of always aroused. And I mean that in the, in the psychological and, and neurological sense. That their baseline sense of safety and security is not what you and I are experiencing. That we know when children are exposed to violence again and again and again in their homes, that the levels of cortisol and adrenaline in their bodies are at a significantly higher rate and stay there over a longer period of time. And so what may look like baseline for them, they still have a little bit more adrenaline, a little bit more cortisol in the systems than you and I do, which means they're always just ready to tip over that line. It always feels like at any moment they could, they could do and go into fight or flight, right? Do we see that as aggressive? Someone with a hair trigger? Someone who's just walking around with a chip on their shoulder? 
And so can this help reframe how we view our clients and how we describe their behavior and think about it more analytically and from an ACE-informed perspective? Okay. We know that pessimism and distorted sense of self-appraisal and shortened sense of, uh, uh, or a sh uh, foreshortened sense of future. How many children have you worked with and you ask them what they'd like to do after they graduate from high school and then they just look at you blankly? Many of you are nodding. You've had that conversation. How many of you are working with adults and you ask them what they'd like to see themselves doing five years from now, 10 years from now? They're just going day by day. It's hard to think out in the future. Future orientation is abstract. That requires frontal lobe functioning, executive functioning. We'll talk about the impact that trauma, that violence has on the development of the frontal lobe and, and an individual's ability to think into the future and to think abstractly and to set goals and to be wary of, of potholes and things that could trip us up, which by the way is critical for cognitive behavioral interventions, for relapse prevention, to be able to think abstractly into the future about something that might trip us up. How many of you have, been, have worked with young children in a substance abuse treatment program and tried to talk about relapse and they give you, well, it'll never happen again. I just won't do it. I just won't do it. I just won't do it. And as a clinician, we're sort of feeling like we're banging our heads against the wall. Well, you know, you say that, but you've relapsed seven times and this is your third treatment episode. And we try to be logical, right, and rational. And they say, well, I just won't do it. I just won't do it. I just won't do it probably because their frontal lobes haven't completely developed yet and thinking into the future abstractly is a real challenge. Even for normal, typical kids that haven't experienced high A scores and we'll, we'll get there in a moment too. Okay. You've got here an image of a developing brain. This is a, um, over time, top left is what a five-year-old's brain might look like versus bottom right, a 20-something year old. We know that brains don't fully mature. The frontal lobe in particular doesn't fully mature into well into our 20s. Looking at these scans, the blue-purple areas are mature, rich, well-developed, fully formed connections. Taking a look at that five-year-old brain, you don't see a whole lot of blue. You don't see a whole lot of purple. It's an immature brain. The frontal lobe is right in the front there, right behind our forehead, right behind our eyebrows. Again, that's consequential thinking, executive functioning, logic, rational, uh, rational thought. It's also the only part of the brain that can keep the amygdala in check. You'll hear Mary Seiss this afternoon spend a lot of time talking about the amygdala and the function that that plays in our brains for survival. The frontal lobe is also important to keep that in check, but it's not fully online until well into our 20s. This, by the way, is normal development, typical, healthy development. The youth that we serve in child welfare, juvenile justice, their brains, we know, the development slows down, is impacted negatively by exposure to violence and traumatic events in childhood. We know that a child who, while chronologically might be 10, 12 years old, falling kind of midway on that line. Chronologically, they're 12. Developmentally, and from a brain maturation standpoint, they're probably further up and to the left. And so you've got a chronological 12-year-old with the brain development of a 10, an 8, a 7, a 6, a 5-year-old. Have any of you experienced that? Yeah, you've got, you've got a child maybe who's 16 years old and is tantruming like a five-year-old. So there's something developmentally out of sync with that. And if we start thinking about ACEs and start thinking about traumatic exposure that may not necessarily be diagnosed as PTSD, and I'll get there in a moment, but if we just talk about chronic exposure to abuse and neglect that we can capture by thinking and talking about ACEs, it begins to help us think about where that child it might be developmentally versus chronologically. And how then does that inform our treatment interventions, the skills that we would like to see that child build? What does that mean for treatment planning, for program development, for community partnerships, thinking about policy and what we want funded? Can it be more ACE-informed, trauma-informed, development-informed, or brain-based? And this is where a lot of the research and a lot of the science is going, 
that it's not just enough to be developmentally sensitive, sensitive when you're treating children and adults, but you've gotta be brain-based and really understand the neuroscience and the development. It's a little bit hard for me to say, I am a social worker after all, and I feel like I'm masquerading as a neuroscientist when I talk about this stuff. But if you can get over that initial fear of, oh my God, we have to talk about the amygdala and the hippocampus and the frontal, you know, the frontal lobe. And if we can get past that and really just talk about what does this mean for us functionally, it starts to become, it starts to come a little naturally. And that, by the way, is one of the strengths of the brain. The more we talk, the more we think, the more we do something, those connections grow stronger, the myelinization happens, it becomes more automatic. And I gotta tell you, talking about, you know, rattling off stuff about the frontal lobe and executive functioning and, and the cerebral cortex, these days is a lot easier than it was when I started a couple of years ago. So I would encourage you not to be scared of this stuff. There's lots of stuff out there that makes this very accessible and it impacts everything that we do and everything we need to be thinking about it. And to be successful with these children, with these families, we have to be brain-based in our interventions, brain-based in our programs, brain-based in our policies, and brain-based in our expectations. And we can start looking at interventions that actually help to mature or push brain development along. And there's good research out there to indicate that it is possible. That just because a child may come in chronologically 16 with the brain of a much younger child, developmentally speaking, we know that good, consistent exposure to protective factors, skill building, safe nurturing environments, we know that they can heal and they can mature and they can catch up. That's the good news. And Mary Seiss will talk to you about that a little bit more in the afternoon. Any questions so far? How we doing? Coming together for people? Yeah? Okay. All right. I put the uh, information from CDC, Kaiser Permanente, up there. And that's, uh, keep in mind that that was a population of adults with insurance getting their medical needs met for the most part. And that was a retrospective look at ACEs and relating that to chronic and lifelong health problems. The NSCAW study was a little bit different. They took the ACE questionnaire and started asking those questions of children that had contact with the child welfare system between the ages of two months and 17 and a half years old, just shy of 6,000 individuals in the sample, and take a look at what they found. The most meaningful thing to me on here is looking at ACEs, the original CDC and Kaiser Permanente study in blue, and the NSCAW study in red. The number of individuals who scored four or more in the original Kaiser Permanente study, significantly lower than in the child welfare population. In other words, kids coming into the system and hitting child protective, foster care, kinship, out-of-home placement has significantly higher ACE scores than the general population. Which probably isn't all that surprising to those of you who've been in the field. My colleague Dean McManus and I presented a similar workshop to this recently in, uh, uh, at a large national conference. And there was an individual in the audience that asked us a question about, about this point in the, uh, in the presentation and said, well, isn't this just new new wine, or uh, old wine rather, in a new bottle. I think on some level it is. That in many ways, this information, this data, this emerging science is validating the experience of clinicians, of social workers, of child protective workers, folks in family court, juvenile probation, all of us have had this experience that our kids, our families, just seem tougher, more damaged, more complicated. They just can't seem to make the decisions necessary to get out of their own ways and, 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 and do the things that they would like to do. And I think this is validating, in a way, that this really says that our collective, subjective experience of these kids and families is, is right on. And suggests that the, the wisdom of social welfare, that your emotional health is connected to your physical health, that your childhood stability is connected to your adult productivity and ability, all of that I think has been intuitive for us for decades and decades. And the science has really been, really, been, uh, really coming together for us. Which I think also, to Susan's point earlier, should be driving advocacy and policy 
and be thinking about flexible and innovative ways to fund, develop, grow programming, and to be more mindful of having impact here, and then watching that trickle down. You heard from Susan, you'll hear from me. A lot of things will echo throughout the day, which you know, seems about right. We're talking about trauma and trauma echoes, right? So you'll have flashbacks all day. You'll hear, hear things again and again and again, right? The good news is you'll remember it if you hear it about 150 times today, right? We know that repeated exposure to violence and trauma has a lasting, a lasting and enduring impact on the brain. It changes the chemistry and the structure, the architecture of the brain is modified by its environment, for better or for worse. We know that the brain is designed to respond to the environment and to be modified to create success, to encourage survival. And so if a child is growing up in a violent or traumatic or adverse environment, the brain will respond for survival and keep that child primed for action for safety, for survival. And so a child in a violent or abusive or neglectful household will always have that slightly elevated level of cortisol and adrenaline, and they'll be ready to go. Moments notice, they're ready to go, ready to keep themselves safe, ready to do what they need to do to, keep, to, uh, to protect themselves. Anyone familiar with the, uh, the movie Antoine Fisher? Yes. yes? It's a great training tool. If you haven't seen it, go see it. Denzel Washington plays a terrific psychiatrist. He's got some good clinical skills, for the most part. Antoine Fisher is the true story of a young man who was raised in the foster care system, inner city. I can't recall if it was Chicago or Detroit. Um, but the true memoir of a, of a young man who grew up in the foster care system and who was abused, tortured, quite honestly, by his foster mother. He runs away from her at some point, ends up in the Navy. And because of the abuse, the neglect, and the maltreatment that he experienced, he's always ready to keep himself safe. There was, there was one scene in the movie where Denzel Washington is uh, trying to terminate the therapeutic relationship with Antoine for being success, successful. They talked about stuff, they processed, they, they learned, he, he, he matured, he grew, and he was able to assess and determine that Antoine was safe and fit to be in the, uh, in the Navy. And I didn't tell you, by the way, but Antoine uh, had this habit of when uh, a commanding officer got in his face and got, uh, got demanding and aggressive and assertive, which I understand commanding officers do in the military, he had a habit of punching them out, <laughs> which is frowned upon in the Navy and other parts of the military. But that was a protective survival response for Antoine. He grew up in a household where he was physically, sexually abused, neglected, and harmed in horrific ways. And so he had to fight to survive. He had to fight to protect himself. And so that adaptive response that kept him safe in that environment went with him when he ran away from home and joined the Navy. And the same things that triggered him at home, turns out, triggered him in the Navy. And so when someone got in his face and yelled and screamed and set a limit and demanded that he do something, got really aggressive with him, he responded automatically and responded aggressively and knocked out senior officers. I think that's a nice parallel for what we experience in child welfare, juvenile justice, working with families, working with youth. They've got a set of skills that have kept them alive long enough to get into your offices, long enough to walk in the front door of your facility, long enough to walk into your courtroom, long enough to walk into your probation department. And we're asking them to stop doing whatever it is that they've been doing that has kept them safe. And so when you want to talk about culture and an invitational approach and to reduce that adversarial connection or relationship that we've got with our clients, that's what I'm talking about. Think about what a client, what a family experiences when they walk in the front door of your facility. Is it warm? Is it welcoming? Is it shaming? Is it embarrassing? Think about the questions that you ask them when you first meet them. How you introduce yourself. When a child comes into residential care, what's the first thing we show them? The rules? Or do we introduce them to peers? Do we get them something to eat? Do we make sure they've got enough clothes? 
Do we take care of their basic needs first, or do we tell them what we want and expect first? When a child walks into your courtroom, whether you're an attorney or a judge, what questions are we asking first about compliance? Probation, we've got conditions, right? Probation expects that people do what they need to do. That's their role, their law enforcement. But how do we have those conversations in a collaborative or cooperative, invitational manner? And so when Susan talks about motivational interviewing, I think that's a set of skills that would serve us all well. Collaborative problem solving, set of skills that would serve us all well. And it's about how do we, as two, two different people, what goals do we have in common? What can we do together? And how can my role as a probation officer, a family court judge, or clinician, or direct care staff, help support you in doing whatever it is you'd like to do? Is there a question or just stretching? Stretching. Nobody move, I will jump on you. <laughs> okay. Any questions at this point? Okay. So we know that significant changes happen in the brain as a result of exposure to trauma, abuse, neglect. The work of Dr. Bruce Perry is pretty impressive and pretty frightening. Um, anyone familiar with his work? Many of you? You can, uh, you can Google his name. He's got uh, connections to the Center for the Developing Child, and he's been doing some really interesting stuff with MRI scans of children who are neglected and abused and comparing them to controls of children who have lived relatively safe and, and, and healthy childhoods. And, there's, and I don't have it in here, and I apologize for that, but there is a frightening slide that he often trains and uses and that I've seen in a number of workshops comparing a normal three-year-old brain MRI scan to the brain scan of a three-year-old who has been severely neglected, and it's about two-thirds smaller. And that really says something about the role that environment plays in brain development, neuropathway development, neurogenesis, and maturity. The work of Bessel van der Kolk is familiar to lots of us who are clinicians. He was a really uh, impressive and important figure in our modern understanding of PTSD. If you think about the history and the, and the background of our understanding of trauma, it really did start in combat situations, that we went from uh, notions of shell shock to combat fatigue to a more modern understanding of PTSD. And, that, and Besser van der Kolk's work uh, uh, was really with returning Vietnam veterans at the, uh, at the VA center in Boston. And he really helped us understand that uh, vets returning back from combat uh, were being triggered by events in the moment, but being thrown back to experiences where their life was, was in danger in Vietnam, overseas. And, and we see that again and again and again with, uh, with, with our soldiers coming back from, uh, uh, from combat. But we also see it in children, and we also see it in adults here. You don't have to go to Afghanistan or, or Vietnam or the South Pacific to experience the levels of stress and life-threatening exposure that, uh, that soldiers have had. But Van der, Kolk is, Van der Kolk's work was important because he, he helped us recognize very, very early that if you looked at the brains of individuals who had, had, who had experienced trauma and were experiencing PTSD as we understand it now, that if they were triggered and their brains kicked into that fright or flight, he helped us understand that blood flow, oxygen, glucose, moves away from the language areas of the brain. Broca's area, moves away from the executive functioning of the brain, frontal lobe, which means talking doesn't have so much of an impact. It means that my role, my skills, my training as a cognitive behavioral therapist, working with someone who's experiencing acute traumatic arousal or hypoarousal, probably going to be ineffective. That the skills that we give our direct care staff and case managers, probation officers, law enforcement to talk to someone and to talk them down. Crisis intervention strategies that rely on verbal interventions. If we're talking about trauma, relatively ineffective. In fact, might make them worse. We could escalate the crisis. Our trainer at LaSalle is found, fond of saying that this is like throwing, throwing gasoline on the fire. And so when we talk about agency culture and training, if we're ACE-informed and trauma-informed, 
it really forces us to take a look at our interventions and where will they work, who will they work with, and under what circumstances are they effective. And that means we've got to be having some conversations with one another about whether or not that intervention worked, whether or not that crisis intervention was effective, or did it exacerbate the situation, and what can we learn from that? How do we get clinicians to be partnering and talking and communicating with direct care staff and faculty. What works in the dorm may not work in the classroom, may not work in the community, may not work in the group room. And so can we be context specific? And can we understand more about their triggers and what set them off? And can we help to modify or manage the environment within a residential setting that's a little bit easier, in an outpatient community-based setting that's much, much harder? But then can we help the client understand what their stressors, what their triggers are, how they respond to those stressors and triggers, and help them get better at identifying certain situations to avoid, or what coping skills they might need, and what supports they might, they might be better off with from parents, coaches, mentors, other supports in the community. And so it really forces us to start taking a look at more of a multi-systemic intervention to resolving the impact of trauma with youth and families. We know that ACEs is related to chemical dependency. I mentioned already that a higher ACE score, four or more, puts someone at greater risk of smoking, substance use, substance use disorders. We know that individuals with higher ACE scores start drinking, start drugging earlier. Anyone want to take a stab as to, as to why that might be? Anyone? Self-medication, right, exactly. Could someone who has experienced a great deal of adverse childhood experiences, a great deal of trauma, if they're walking away with that sense of despair, fear, apathy, desensitization, might they be self-medicating some, some of those symptoms with, with substances? Absolutely, and I think we all see that in our youth and in the families that we work with. The relationship between ACEs and delinquency. How many of you are with uh, juvenile justice? Some capacity? Okay. About a quarter of you, looks like. All right. Think for a moment about the kinds of stuff that's getting an individual, gets a child into the family court system, into the probation system, PINs, JD adjudications, those sorts of things. And I don't want to minimize those behaviors. They're engaging in some harmful acts. They're hurting people. They're hurting themselves. They're damaging property. So I don't want to whitewash and I don't want to minimize that in any way. But can we start thinking about what's behind those behaviors? If we think about those behaviors as an externalized symptom of the distress that they are feeling, having been exposed to a great number of ACEs, it starts to change how we think about delinquency. It starts to change how we think about a PINS youth who won't go to school no matter the intervention no matter how many times they've been on pins, no matter how many times they've met with their probation officer, no matter how many violations they may have racked up, that that doesn't seem to be an effective intervention for a lot of the youth that we work with. We've already said that under the best of circumstances, youth, their frontal lobes aren't fully developed. Consequential thinking isn't really online to the extent that it is for all of us. We've certainly all had the experience of working with a child, working with a youth in our care, and saying the same thing over and over again, and trying to lay out, well, if you do A, then B's gonna happen. And if you do B, C's gonna happen. And it's logical, it's rational, it makes sense to us, because our frontal lobes are fully developed. We can think that way. We're good at consequential thinking. Kids in general are not, and kids with ACEs are even less so. And so that intervention, that punishment, that consequence is not going to deter the behavior, if that behavior is serving another more important need. Because if the truancy is related to doing something, drug use, hanging out with delinquent peers, that is some way, in some way self-medicating that sense of despair and distress associated with the trauma, additional consequences are not and never going to beat the benefit of whatever it is they're doing. So we've got to be asking ourselves, what's going on? What is that behavior? What's driving that behavior? And can we start looking past the delinquency and start looking for that underlying cause or motivator? and start asking ourselves, what is this behavior telling us? What is the child trying to communicate with that behavior? And that drives our intervention. That drives our strategy and our treatment planning and the community partnerships.
that probation, and I see many of you from Albany County Probation over here, is strong and as valuable a team as you are, I also know that you happen to recognize that partnering with, with community providers and residential providers is important. That probation can't work in a vacuum, and neither can treatment providers. I gotta tell you, it, it helps having some leverage, and you push the client to me and we'll work together. And those are the kind of partnerships and relationships that I think we need to enhance and develop and be thinking mindfully about how do we do that with ACEs as a common language and treatment and outcomes. What are we really trying to accomplish here? Okay. Taking another step forward with juvenile justice, we know that kids in the juvenile justice system have a great deal of mental health issues and diagnoses. That a snapshot taken in 2006 revealed that 43%, just shy of half, of kids in, this, in the juvenile justice system. And this is a cross system. This is a, a, a diversion. This is detention. This is out-of-home placement, secure settings, non-secure settings. So really the, the full spectrum of juvenile justice, slightly less than half of the individuals in that system have four or more mental health diagnoses. That's a pretty complicated kid. The most frequent ones, mood disorder, substance abuse disorder, bipolar, anxiety, PTSD, not so much. Studies really range. You can see studies that show as little as zero to about 20 or 30 percent of kids in the juvenile justice system meeting criteria for PTSD diagnosis. Really depends on the sample, the study, how they, how they come to that diagnosis. So again, if we can start looking past that externalizing behavior, past that delinquency, past the behavior that got that kid, got that family, got that adult into your office, and instead of just focusing on, and you'll hear this echoed again later when, when Mary Seiss takes the stage, instead of just focusing on what they did and start asking what happened, stop asking what's wrong with you, start asking what happened to you, get past that presenting problem, get past that externalizing behavior, and start looking behind for what's driving that. And maybe it's underlying mental health, maybe it's trauma, maybe it's ACEs, and that I think is the, is the language that we can share. Once we've gotten there, and once we've figured out what's, what's underneath that behavior, what's the perpetuating factor? It may not be the cause, but it may be a perpetuating factor. We've got a responsibility collectively to have some impact, to build some skills and to shore that individual up. And we get there through treating the mental health and psychiatric disorders, psychotherapy, pharmacology, combination. By taking a look at their behaviors, doing some behavioral modification, teaching them skills, taking a look at family dysfunction. Kids don't live in a vacuum. They don't live independent of their families even if they're in foster care, even if they're in residential care, they're still connected to their families and oftentimes they go back. More often than not, they go back. We want them to go back. So that means we've got to be working with families before, during, after, placement. Community interventions have to support families. When we think about policy and program development, um, outpatient mental health clinics can serve children. Can they treat parents in the same clinic? Many can't. Is that an effective strategy? Wouldn't we prefer to treat the family in the same place? And certainly we can partner with a great adult mental health clinic across town, but we all know the challenges associated with that. Communication, time, collaboration. It fragments the service delivery. And so wouldn't we prefer to treat a child and the adult caregiver in the same clinic? to think about their family treatment needs as being one and the same as their ind respective individual treatment needs. And that's true for substance abuse, and that's true for mental health. And so I think we've got a nice capacity for that built in already in the child welfare system, that if we're talking about prevention cases, we identify the family as the client. And we can put services in for the children and for the siblings, regardless of who the identified patient is. That same model, that same way of thinking does not exist under OASIS and OMH licensure. So can we shift? Can we think about how to move systems and to, and to maybe erase some of those regulatory lines 
that keep us in boxes, keep us in silos, keep us compartmentalized, and start thinking about how we grow and flex and move and push those boundaries out a little bit. Educational deficits. We know there's a strong link between reading, achievement, and risk for delinquency. There's also a strong link between poverty and reading ability. In other words, the more impoverished you are, the greater likelihood that you'll have higher A scores, the less likely you'll have a parent who reads to you and primes your brain for the ability to read. Reading is kind of an interesting process. It requires left-right hemisphere communication, which happens over the corpus callosum. Girls, by the way, have about 20% larger corpus callosum than boys. Sorry, guys. They beat us again. They develop faster. The left-right hemisphere connects and communicates much more quickly, much more efficiently, and much earlier in female development than in males. And even that development slows down in individuals who have high A scores and high exposure to poverty, trauma, abuse, neglect. And so if we roll this backwards, if we know that delinquency is related to reading achievement, reading level is related to brain maturation, and brain maturation hinges on exposure to safe, nurturing environments that are not abusive or neglectful. We really begin to see how important early intervention is on a neurological level. It's always felt right, again, in social welfare. It's always felt right in child welfare. We've always understood this collectively and anecdotally. The science is validating us. We were in the right place. And we've got the skill set as a sector to be able to do this well, if we can start partnering in a, in a more meaningful, consistent, collaborative way. I mentioned before that many of the youth in the juvenile justice system have, ex have experienced a great deal of abuse and neglect, physical abuse, sexual abuse, exposure to gang violence, and they act it all out. I'm a parent, I've got two young children. They act out stuff they hear and see. Most of the time it's good. For those of you who are parents, you understand that kids act out how they experience life. They learn, they develop, they grow, they practice being an adult through play. Children who grow up in violent, neglectful households, what does their play look like? It looks violent and abusive. So we know that children act out the experiences that they are exposed to. And we know that kids with high A scores act out quite a bit. They get themselves in trouble. They get identified pretty early by the juvenile justice system. They're those kids that are getting early pins, petitions. They're catching early JD charges. They're hitting the system early and young. And yet many of the kids that we serve don't meet criteria or haven't met criteria for PTSD. There's a couple reasons for that, I think. And I can just share with you um, off the top of my head, at, La at LaSalle School, we serve about uh, 78 youth in our residential program. And I'll talk about our ACE scores and our population in a moment. But I would say less than a dozen, off the top of my head, carry a formal diagnosis of PTSD out of 78, despite the ACE scores I'm about to show you. It often presents differently, PTSD that is, presents differently in children. And I'm glad that in the new DSM, DSM, DSM-5 um, came out recently, the psychiatric community is beginning to shift, is beginning to look at psychiatric illness and treatment and recovery as being related to development. The whole book has changed. It moves through development in terms of its structure. In other words, childhood disorders are at the front of the book, adult disorders are at the back, and you move through the lifespan as you go from chapter one to chapter or whatever it goes to. It's also carved out PTSD as being somehow different in children under six than it is for older children and adults, which means as a community, we're getting to understand that children experiencing trauma look different than adults experiencing trauma. And so it may not present in the way that we've been trained as clinicians, and it's important that we're paying attention to the emerging science, the emerging research around trauma and how that manifests in children. We also often misdiagnose it. There's a really interesting study that uh, was published in, in 2000. It looked at the relationship or the, or, uh, um, the overlap between 
PTSD and attention hyperactivity disorder in children who have been sexually abused. It's a one for one overlap, meaning for clinicians, good luck differentiating between ADHD and PTSD. So are there children in our populations that we've misdiagnosed as having ADHD around a psychostimulant and they just don't seem to be getting any better? They're not responding to medication. Give them more medication. Give them different medication. Could it be that we've misdiagnosed them? That we've mistaken their hyperactivity as hyperarousal or hypervigilance? That we've mistaken their impulsivity for hyperarousal, hypervigilance, flight or fight, that we've mistaken that restlessness as that hypoarousal, that they're sort of chronically always ready to go. Always ready to go. At LaSalle, we've been paying attention to ACEs for a couple of years. We've um, clearly, through the structure of today, we've got a strong collaborative relationship with the university. I'm thankful for that because it gives us access to lots of PhDs and lots of graduate students who don't mind combing through tons of data, and if they do, they keep it to themselves because they want their PhDs. So they're able to look at data and turn it around for us in a way that we probably wouldn't be able to do on our own. We've been tracking ACE scores for our individuals in our residential, day service, outpatient, detention alternative programs for about a year and a half, two years. This is the data that's starting to come out for us. About 40% of our population, ages 12 to 21, across the range of services that we provide, 40% of our youth have answered yes to five or more questions on the ACE questionnaire. Children as young as 12 are answering yes to five or more questions on the ACE questionnaire. And we have youth in our care that have answered yes to eight, to nine, to 10. They've gotten a perfect score of 10. Perfectly awful. I'm gonna introduce ACEs to you as a questionnaire, as a concept. Kaiser Permanente, the CDC, were asking adults about exposure to adverse childhood experiences prior to the age of 18. We've got children as young as 12 answering yes to five or more questions. Now, if we do our jobs right, as a community, as a system, they won't get any more yeses. These are static numbers, we can't take them away. I can't erase those. I can't take a child who's answered yes to five today and hope that next week, next month, next year, they'll only say yes to four or three. Static. But can we as providers or as a system and community help to mitigate the impact of those ACE scores? Can we start thinking about where these children, where these youth, where these families are coming from? Susan talked about states that are looking at state samples of ACE data. I'd like to see zip code data. What pockets, what neighborhoods in our city, in our county, in our state have higher ACE scores than others? And what might that mean about program development, policy, funding, interventions? How can we start using this data to drive where we're spending money, how we're spending, and what we want to see be different a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. We're also beginning to break down our ACE scores between subpopulations. LaSalle School happens to have a very well-developed treatment program specifically for sexually aggressive youth. These are kids who have been adjudicated of engaging in some type of sexually harmful behavior. Historically, about 80 to 90% of them have also been victims of sexual abuse prior to their sexual acting out, prior to being adjudicated. We've looked at their scores. We've typically referred to that program as a juvenile sexual victim and offender program, victim and offender, because we've always seen the relationship between sexual abuse and sexually harmful behavior. The number jumps. It went from about 40% to 63% of our youth in this particular program answer yes to five or more questions. So again, that anecdotal, that subjective experience that we've had as clinicians of being specialists 
in working and assessing with and managing risk associated with juvenile sexually harmful behavior, we've recognized a linkage between their own histories of abuse, neglect, assault, and they're acting out, their sexually harmful behavior. And so what does this mean in terms of program development? If you're working with offenders, whether they're sexual offenders or other violent offenders, do we also have to pay attention to the trauma they've, they've experienced? And that's a very different mindset that we have to see offenders as having histories as victims. And then if we're not mindful of that as treatment providers, or as law enforcement, probation, parole, folks who are developing policy, folks who are developing programs, if we're not treating the victimization, treating the trauma, we're probably just putting a Band-Aid on the, on the aggression and the acting out. I mentioned Neary and MASOC earlier. A lot of good research coming out of the New England Adolescent Research Institute. They looked at a population of residentially placed youth that had gone into residential care for sexual aggression and compared them to residentially placed youth who went into residential care for everything else. And they looked at outcomes and recidivism specific to sexual aggression, rearrest, and adjudication. Those two populations had equal rates of sexual abuse post residential treatment after successful treatment and discharge, which is really interesting. When a youth comes into care for sexual aggression, we treat the sexual aggression and then send them on their way. When a youth comes in for physical aggression, theft, drug abuse, all the other things that kids get placed for, we treat them for that and then we send them on their way. But if they're both just as likely to engage in a sexually harmful act post-discharge, we've missed something. We've really missed something. And I think this is part of why. That we know that the trauma pops up and manifests in externalizing behaviors in a variety of different ways. And if we just sort of put our thumb on the sexual acting out, it'll pop up over here as something else. Or if we just put our thumb on the carjacking, it'll pop up over here as something else. We've missed the underlying cause or the underlying root, the precursor to that acting out behavior. We lost that in sight of treating the presenting problem, which is why I stressed earlier, as law enforcement, as family court judges, as probation, as treatment providers, get past that externalizing behavior and start looking at what's going on behind the scenes. Otherwise, it's going to pop up somewhere else, looking some other way, and they'll get in treatment for that. They'll resolve that. It'll pop up again. Might that have something to do with how often a kid or an adult hits our system in different places? It really starts to come together when you think about the collective experience of us in juvenile justice, mental health, child welfare. It just feels like we're playing whack-a-mole with the problems. Well, maybe because the problem is the underlying trauma that we haven't successfully treated or mitigated. And it really changes how we think about program development, policy, treatment, and so on and so forth. Okay. Any questions, comments? We're doing okay? Yeah, right here. The question is, um, is there a relationship between ACE scores and adult sexual offenders that there may not be a correlation? And is that, is that a fair reframe of the question? The most current research shows not much correlation between recidivism and trauma. So the, 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 the comment, the question is that there's not much correlation between ACE scores and adult sexual offenders. And I think a key difference between adult sexual offenders and juvenile sexual offenders is that we know that by and large, for the vast majority of juveniles who engage in sexually harmful behavior, it's not a deviant sexual arousal or pathology driving the sexual acting out. That it's, it's a manifestation of the abuse, the trauma, neglect, the lack of social skills, a lot of other factors that are the driving factors of the motivation for that sexual acting out, whereas when we're talking about adult sexual offenders, we're talking about individuals that have some pretty well-developed uh, pathology, deviant sexual arousal and interests. They may still have exposure to sexual abuse, trauma, and other ACE scores, but we're talking about a very different uh, set of uh, etiological reasons for that, for that behavior. And so I would, I would caution some of, uh, that some of this is probably doesn't, doesn't overlay to most uh, 
adult sexual offender uh, populations, but certainly there are many that are. And I've treated my fair share of individuals who have acted out as adults and developmentally, cognitively, in terms of brain maturity and emotional uh, maturity, they might be, you know, 25, 26, maybe even, uh, you know, uh, getting close to their 30th birthday, and in many ways they're acting like an adolescent. And that lack of judgment and that lack of decision making and consequential thinking, to me, I would treat them more like an adolescent than, and less like an adult. And so it gets, it gets a little bit more complicated with adults. Does that, does that go to your point? Yeah, the, the question is, are there any, are there any, is there any research that really looks at that, as that, that subgroup of adult sexual offenders? Off the top of my head, I, I don't know, but I would point you in the direction of ATSA and uh, the Massachusetts Association. Uh, so the national ATSA is really paying attention to ACEs. The keynote speaker at the national conference this year was talking about ACEs and trauma and talking about looking at uh, uh, different populations within the adult community and really seeing juvenile work as very different than adult. And so I would, I'd, I'd say as a national organization, they're really paying close attention to this and I'd be watching for studies coming out of ATSA. I'd be really be looking at uh, NERI and MESOC, that they've been way ahead of the curve in, in looking at that young adult population and kind of categorizing them a little bit more like juveniles than, than adults. And, and so I would would look for uh, uh, names like Dave Burton or Phil Rich, and uh, I think you'll find what you're looking for there. Yeah. Can you see what ATSA is? ATSA is the Association for the Treatment of Sexual Abusers. There's a national organization, but each state has their own chapter. The, yes? We, we are collecting the scores with our CD population, uh, the ones that are in residential placement and outpatient. Uh, I just, I, I didn't break out the numbers for you, but, uh, but certainly can, can get data to you. I want to compare our, uh, our population to the um, uh, larger samples, that when we look at our uh, sexually aggressive youth population, the JSOP youth, the blue, versus our general population, you see scores come down compared to the BRFSS sample from the CDC. This is an ongoing survey that Susan mentioned where states are looking at their overall, overall ACE scores within larger communities. And so you can see, again, the echo here is our population residentially placed significantly higher ACE scores, five or more jumping up significantly from, uh, from the green in the national samples to the red in our general residential population to the blue in our sexual aggressive population. And again, trauma is an underlying factor, something that requires attention and treatment and intervention. Okay. I mentioned Joanne Schladel earlier, and um, I'd like to come back because I'm a big fan of hers. But she gives us a really nice theoretical model for intervention, for treatment, for practice, for thinking about how trauma works in an individual and what we can do to mitigate its effects. She talks about trauma as being a historical factor over on the left. It's something in the past. We can't erase it. It doesn't go away. The trigger is in the moment. It's in the present. It's something that fires the amygdala and gets that response that was protective in the past where the original trauma occurred. The trauma echo we think about often as flashbacks and how we're called back to that original traumatic event and that memory. And here's where, here's where Joe's framework is really interesting and how it really impacts what it is we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis with youth and families with high A scores. She talks about choices as being a conscious or unconscious process, that an individual can do something either automatic or more purposefully. That when we're talking about acting out or acting in, hurting others, hurting myself, these are the behaviors that kids are coming into our systems with. These are the behaviors that are adults are coming into our systems with, those acting out behaviors, aggression, theft, abuse, versus the acting in, the hurting myself, substance abuse, cutting, suicide, eating disorders, things that are harmful to me. Those things have a role in managing the distress associated with trauma. They're self-protective in the short run, but they don't really help us make better choices, they don't help us heal, they don't help us move forward. And so she really talks about treatment 
as helping a client understand this pattern, understand that they have choices, understand that with skill building and skill development, they can make different choices and move toward healing and self-acceptance and taking care of ourselves and the people around us. And again, Mary will come back here later this afternoon after we break for lunch, and we really will we'll talk about interventions and what we're understanding more and more about brain science and how that, how that influences treatment. I really struggled over the last couple of days developing the last couple of slides here. I felt compelled to give you all the answers and to send you all marching back home and to your agencies and back to work tomorrow with a list of things to do. And I realized I don't know all the answers. But I trust that you do, or you'll figure it out. You'll take what you've heard today. You'll think on it over lunch. You'll talk to each other. You'll start that creative process with one another if you're here with colleagues. You'll be energized. You'll go back tomorrow and start talking to your peers. You'll start thinking about it. And I guess I'd like you to be thinking about what you could be doing differently in your home agencies tomorrow. What could you be doing differently to advocate for policy shift, for different funding, to be thinking about brain-based interventions? Again, what does a client experience when they first come into your organization? What's it like for you? Walk through your lobby, pretend you're a client. Is that a warm, welcoming, inviting experience? Or is that shameful, embarrassing, not so nice? How might that impact engagement, motivation to keep on coming back? I don't know about you, but when I go to my doctor's office, the receptionist hardly ever looks up at me. I'm not a big fan of that. It'd be nice if she'd make eye contact with me. I go to my pediatrician, well, my daughter's pediatrician. He's typing away at the laptop while he's doing an exam. Doesn't look up at me or at her. I find that troubling. Can we think about our daily practices and how we respond to the individuals that we're working with and start thinking about it from their perspective? Can we start thinking about how our environments are set up, how our classrooms are set up, how our dormitories are set up, how our lobbies are set up? Are they stimulating environments that encourage people to think and to be challenged? Are they colorful? Are they engaging? Are they warm? You walk into many congregate care facilities and they're pretty stark, pretty gray, pretty bland. They've got that furniture that you couldn't possibly break if you threw it off a 10-story building. <laughs> the same beige-colored walls in every facility. Can we start using blue? Red? Can we ask a child what their favorite color is or what their favorite food is coming in? Can we allow them to bring materials from home that make them more comfortable? Can we help them feel acclimated and cared for before we start hitting them with the rules and expectations and explaining the level system? Can we think about what they need versus what we want? And how do we start changing how we interact with our clients? I've talked already about how we reframe pathology and stop thinking about resistance as a dirty word. It's protective. I took an ego psychology class here, just down the hall. And I was taught that resistance is protective. If someone's not ready to talk about something, there's a reason for that. And as clinicians, I think we sort of feel compelled to kind of blast through that wall and you gotta talk, you gotta talk, you gotta talk. Well, Mary will talk to you after lunch about how damaging and counterproductive that might be. And if you get a client to talk about the trauma before they're ready and have the skills to manage what's gonna come up for them emotionally, you just did some harm. So can we think about pacing and timing and trust? There's a lot of pressure on us as practitioners to get in, fix, and get out fast. Kids are coming into care later and later with more complex behaviors. We're shortening the time that they've got with us, and we're expected to offset the damaging effects of all this stuff. I would say this makes us, you know, forces us to take a look at what we really expect in six months of residential care. What can we really achieve? Do we need more time with certain children? Absolutely. And if they leave at six months, what community supports do we need to have in place to ensure that they will continue to get safe, nurturing environments 
that encourage neurogenesis. The good news in all of this is that while as, as scary and, and upsetting as it might be to hear that children's brains are literally smaller as a result of exposure to trauma and adverse childhood experiences, there is also new and exciting emerging research that's indicating that growth and neurogenesis and maturation and catch-up is possible. That in the right kind of environment with the right kind of supports and the right kind of skill building, the brain can regenerate and grow and develop new pathways and a kid can catch up. It probably doesn't happen in a day. It probably doesn't happen in a week or a month or in even six months of residential care or in two years of outpatient care. But it's over time and it's with consistency and a community wrapped up around that child. It's schools working with law enforcement, working with courts, working with providers, working with mentors, educators, parents, caregivers, extended family. So when Susan talks about how are the children, how are we doing, what would make a healthy community, ACEs I think gives us a nice platform to be starting from, some common language and some goals. And I also want to close thinking about, again, I started with CDC, that this is a public health issue. A public health issue requires a public health response. It's not just the mental health system. It's not just the child welfare system. It's not just the medical health system. That those collaborations and partnerships and cross-funding and cross-training and cross-support will be required to move forward and into the future. Thank you so much.